She said she would buy the lingerie herself. And after all, the weather was ideal, and it was her first day out in Florence. She wanted something to do. So she pranced across the Arno and visited her favorite vintage boutiques. Too expensive for her to afford, but she could look, couldn't she? That skirt, I believe, was 200 euro. After two long and solemn months in London, and then 14 days in quarantine in Florence, she pursued people watching like a career. She must have walked four or five miles, I don't know, to get to this carrot cake in this particular bar in the Altarno. There are a few construction workers standing and talking with the barista, and she found a cozy chair in the back and set up her laptop to read, or pretend to read, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. Her life in the two weeks prior to this momentous occasion in a cafe in the Altrano consisted of ordering and unpacking groceries to cook her own meals, salmon and rice and croissants with avocado and egg and other little bits and pieces that took 20 or 30 minutes to cook. This was also her first birthday that she spent absolutely alone, so she bought a bottle of Prosecco for the occasion. Her long-distance boyfriend, he lived in Los Angeles, shipped her a Maybeth easel as a birthday present so she wouldn't have any excuses not to draw anymore. As she destroyed the carrot cake and took away its aesthetic appeal, she thought about everything she wanted to buy. That lingerie she mentioned, some products from Sephora, her Fenty makeup that never shipped from London. Hopefully they had her shade. And why did she order her tea in English? She definitely knew how to say, may I have a cup of tea, peach tea, and a piece of carrot cake in Italian, for she had just learned it at Italian school. Vuoi un po' di caffè? A little man was pouring her a cup of cafe, or coffee, <laughs> before she could fully respond. He was a merchant at one of the flea markets that pop up randomly in Florence around the corner when you least expect it, and he was selling sweaters and lots of random items that, although she wanted to buy them to support him, did not fit her style. She said no grazie, but she did purchase two coats from this gentleman by the name of Marco in the piazza the following day. Florence felt changed. She'd expected to be giddy and somewhat stupid as tourists are when they visit a city and are far removed from the daily life of locals. But instead she felt melancholy. The Uffizi was closed. Trattorie, where before you had to get a reservation two days in advance, now would be lucky if one person came every hour. Nabucco Wine Bar, just off San Marco, was one such place, a haven for locals to get spritz and aperitivo and even a panini or pasta for lunch. Some people celebrated their graduations here. Anyway, she had seen people, but she had not seen people. Her people, I mean. Florence was a city of cliques, large and intimate groups of people who socialized exclusively together. At the moment, however, she just wanted some new bras and underwear, and she got them from Intimissimi. It wasn't La Perla or Cosa Bello, but it would do. At least it was a step above Victoria's Secret, she told herself. On Valentine's Day, her engineering boyfriend took a break from his dissertation to spoil her with gifts like a gratitude journal and French perfume as well as brunch. They spent five hours telling each other all of the wonderful things they'd fallen in love with and future plans and playing games and watching movies like To All The Boys Part 3 but not finishing it and instead falling asleep with each other on the call. That weekend she'd also started sketching again. A professor had asked her to sketch an apple but a pepper was close enough. She was practicing sighting techniques, such as holding a pencil out in front of you and checking the length against the width, and squinting to simplify values and translate them onto the paper. The first pepper didn't come out right at all. It was a little wobbly, so she tried again. That pepper looked a bit more realistic, 
but she couldn't wait until class with Sergei to really fine-tune her skill. Sergei was brilliant. He had her work on a cast of the Statue of David's heir, and she learned to focus on composition first, and then proportion, and then separate the light and shadow with a flat tone, and gradually build up the detail, going darker and adding more nuance along the shadow line, building up value subtly, and focusing on unifying rather than breaking things up. She also learned the importance of getting rid of lines, for there are no lines in nature, only areas of color one against the other. Two out of seven days a week, she met up with some Erasmus students and they risked getting caught by the police to drink some wine in a piazza on a rainy night. But as much as she loved these youthful displays of rebellion, nothing compared to her affection for the Kashin market, perhaps the mecca of thrifting. She looked beyond the items that hung on hungers, for there were usually 20 euro or so, and went straight for the one euro and two euro piles. And she found lots of cute things like a pinafore plaid dress, a white sweater, a plaid sweater, you know those trendy ones in right now, a lace red top, some gloves, socks, and even a one euro vest. On the weekend, Daphne hosted a late birthday dinner party at her house with her friend Eleanor, who was visiting from Paris, and our friend Mirai and myself, and we ordered Rooster, probably the best American brunch place I've had on this side of the world. We talked about being angry when people mistook us for American and what it was like studying in Boston versus in LA. We also talked about grandmothers who paid us to force their saggy boobs into bras and what we would ask for on our wish list if we were sugar babies. Mariah gave a charming story about how, in Istanbul, she'd asked her parents for a dog, and instead her grandparents brought her a sheep. The sheep was pretty much like a dog, however, so it worked out well. Daphne showed us pictures of her late grandmother's beautiful mansion and all of the other artifacts that that lovely woman left her, including a beige pencil skirt and different jewelry and jackets. And Eleanor mentioned casually that her mother studied history at Pepperdine University, so I found a fellow wave, well, sort of. After such a large meal, we could hardly move, but I figured since it was Eleanor's last night in the city, we should head out and show her around a bit. As it was Orange Zone, there was technically no place to go at 7 p.m. Bars were not allowed to serve drinks, museums were closed, and restaurants could only have people for takeaway. But we walked around and window shopped and laughed. My more scrupulous viewers may have observed that I have switched point of view. No reason in particular except that I've been reading too much Nabokov. Lolita, specifically Humbert Humbert, ruined me. As Eleanor and Mirai rode the merry-go-round, Daphne and I convinced ourselves against it. But I was thinking how even during normal times in Florence, walking around is what Italians do best and enjoying the simple things. It's il dolce far niente. Italians don't need much for entertainment, even if it's a few buckets and some sticks. If you like this video, subscribe to see more of my life as a classical student in Florence.